Hello and welcome to EduTalk. This is a program where we deal with all aspects of education and parenting. Before applying our laser focus onto the issue of tonight's show, I want to take a step back and ask a big philosophic question, which is, what is it that society should provide to our children when it comes to education? That's a tough question, and it's a hard question, partially because of how broad it is. We could spend the whole evening and many more talking about this issue philosophically. So what I want to do is focus in on one aspect of it, which is the legislative aspect. When it comes to the law, what is it that sh society should provide? Knowing legislation like No Child Left Behind and Obama's ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, we might be tempted to look at the federal government and federal legislation. But if we did that, we would be missing the target. The reason is that all powers not specifically delegated to the federal government goes to the states. And the states are mostly in control of what happens in terms of education. Now again, our focus could get too big if we tried to consider all the different states in the country or even a bunch of them. So because our show sources out of New York, we're going to focus in on New York state law when it comes to education. In order to do this, strangely enough, we're not going to look at the Constitution. We're not going to look at, that is, the Constitution of New York state. We're not going to look at the New York State Department of Education. Instead, we're going to look at a court case that was brought by the Campaign for Fiscal Equity against New York State. This case took many years and eventually found its way up to the highest court in New York State, the New York State Court of Appeals. Anything that the New York State Court of Appeals says is as good as being state law. In this case, they laid out specifically what New York State had to provide for education to its children. They found, they decided, that what was needed was a sound, basic education. How does that sound? That sounds rather vague to me, Mark. What does a basic education include? It doesn't really give me any idea about that. It doesn't really lay things out. Um, and I think that the justices knew that. And they didn't exactly explain everything, but they did talk about what minimum resources had to be provided. And we'll use our edu chalkboard to highlight these resources. They said that we needed to have suitable curricula, sufficient books and supplies, safe environment, help for at-risk students, resources for those with disabilities, adequate buildings, sufficient teachers, and appropriate class sizes. So how does that sound? Still incredibly vague. I mean, you're using language like sufficient, adequate, suitable. What, is, what do those even mean? They're not defined at all. If we try to sort of put those into numbers, put those into specifics, we're stuck. We don't know where to go. Now, again, this discussion could get way too big. So rather than focus on all of those different resources, we're going to focus in on one tonight. Today's episode is going to be about class size. So what is an appropriate class size? I think if we're focusing on the appropriate class size, we should have a look at what the average class size is at the moment in U.S. public schools. And according to the Seattle Times from 2014, there were 24 children in elementary classes and 30 high school students in a class on average. Now, now that we know the average class size, it doesn't really tell us if that's an appropriate class size. And I think we need to ask the question, what should a class size be appropriate for? What are we looking for to make it appropriate? 
Are we looking at the test result at, uh, at the end? Are we looking at how much a student stays focused in class or is engaged? Or is it important to look at the learning progress um, of every child in the class? Um, I guess as teachers, we could use our own experience that we have in class, but I'm pretty sure there must be some sort of research out there that gives us more hard facts. It is. I mean, there is research out there. Um, but the question is, does the research show that the class size affects student achievement? Um, a lot of these studies um, kind of go on the premise that class size would influence instructional behavior, and then from there, increase student engagement and student achievement in general. Um, there was a kind of consensus study by David Zingier um, over at Evidence Base, and he analyzed 112 peer-reviewed studies, and, showed, and he showed that the overwhelming majority of these studies found that smaller classes have a significant influence on student achievement and narrowing that achievement gap. So he didn't so much do a study himself. Instead, he did a study of studies. He looked at all these other studies and tried to compile and summarize these results. He gave the statistical average over all the studies that are out there. But in general, because most of these studies sometimes contradict each other, that's why he was doing that statistical average. Because in general, there is no definitive answer from any one research study. Um, because there's too many variables to control in all of this. There's the instructional method of the teacher, and then there's the actual student makeup in each of these classes. You can't have one student be in a control study, and then one student be in an, exper in a, in an experimental program. I mean, it'd be great if we could clone one class, clone another class, and then we can try a big class size and a small class size and see what the difference is. But you don't have that ability to control real life. So the research, it gets very, very difficult to be able to do. And then you run into the ethical question because you have the student's education at stake. You don't want to disadvantage them or not give them the education that they deserve. So there's the ethical question. And then I think you have teacher questions as well. You have teachers who we're expecting are going to adapt the way that they teach based on having a smaller class size. And if they just teach in the same way to a smaller group and the group doesn't do any differently, have we actually learned anything about whether reducing class size is useful or not? I think that creates another set of problems. It does. So because the research is so inconclusive and that you have to look at these huge statistical averages of the studies to actually find any kind of answer, it's probably best that we look at some of the experiences of teachers that actually teach in small class sizes. It's a little sad that science isn't necessarily going to provide for us the clear answer, but it almost isn't that it's about to provide that answer. There may be so many challenges involved that we may not be able to say, give us enough time and we'll have a study. We may have to look in a wholly different place. And I think the place to look at is the teacher experience with small class sizes. Now, we are working with class sizes of, uh, what, 5 to 15 students on average. And maybe we can talk a little bit about the experience that we had in classes. Now, what I have found um, in a small class size is that I was able to use techniques that I wouldn't have been able to use in a larger size class of 24 or 30 children. It really allowed me to try out different techniques that would have probably been impossible um, to do. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about these kinds of method methods. And something that I'm using a lot um, lately is inquiry-based learning. This is an approach where the learning takes place completely by the student. It is not me as a teacher that is telling them this is how something works. It is actually the student figuring it out by him or herself. I'm as the teacher, I am just the facilitator. Through questioning and encouraging, I'm trying to lead the children to the right answer or to the answer that um, I have let out for my classes. But how are they going to learn anything if you're not explaining it to them and then they're understanding it? Maybe it's easier if I give you a little example. Um, one of my classes is a dinosaur and fossils class. And right at the beginning of the year, I wanted them to understand how archaeologists work. Now, I could have done it that way, and I'm showing a video of an archaeologist and 
talking about how they work, what kind of tools they're using. And instead of doing that, I'm actually letting them be archaeologists. So they are learning by actually doing the activity of an archaeologist. So I'm giving them the set of tools. Uh, some of them are totally inappropriate to use to um, excavate bones. And then I have the ones in there that are the ones that archaeologists actually use on a daily basis. Now they are figuring out by you know, talking about the different tools, what impact will the tool have? Will I be able to get the bone out without actually breaking it in half? So using a sledgehammer is not the best idea. I need to use a chisel. And by doing that, they have actually learned how to be an archaeologist. So later on, when they think back and are asked questions about what's it like to be an archaeologist, they're not recalling what somebody told them. They're, they're almost recalling their own experience as an archaeologist. Yes, and the discussion that's coming out of that is just fantastic, and they're very lively to remember this experience. So inquiry instruction is one method. Yes, another method that we're using is self-directed learning, and we have talked about this at length in our last Edu talk show. So what that means is that the child, again, is in charge of their learning. They are choosing what they would like to learn, they are implementing activities to learn new skills, to learn about a topic, and then they're assessing their own learning. Was I successful? Am I now using those skills? And as a teacher, again, we are facilitators. So I'm, I'm there to help them along in their process of learning. I'm giving them appropriate materials. I might connect them with people who know about the skills that they want to learn, and they can learn from these people. So not so much the traditional role as a teacher, but almost like you're a friend of somebody who wants to learn something or has a real interest. And we might go to our friend and say, oh, hey, I know somebody else who's interested in that. You might want to talk to them. Or I just heard about this great book on that same subject matter. You may want to look at that book. And you're providing these resources for areas that they're already interested in. And as adults, we're using this method all the time. So why not use it in the classroom? It works, and we know that it works. Another method is project-based learning, which is a teaching method where the students gain knowledge and skills by tackling a, pro a, um, a problem over a really extended period of time. So they are tackling this problem by dipping their toes into all different kinds of areas because they need to acquire many, many skills to be able to finish this project. I remember a project like this done at our school where they built a 12-foot high catapult. And in order to do that, they had to do research, they had to do mathematics, physics, engineering, they had to have woodworking skills, they had to know how to use the tools, they had to work together as a group. You're drawing from all of these different academic areas on a big project which they are only able to complete after a long period of time. Which they did, by the way. <laughs> this is what I really love about this method, is this overlapping of different areas in education, which is basically reflecting daily life. This is what we're doing. We're not just, you know, working in one field. We are learning from all different um, areas on a daily basis. Um, I think one of the things that's very interesting about all of these methods is that they would be very challenging to do with groups of 24 to 30 kids, maybe impossible in a lot of cases. But if you're working with groups of 10 to 15 kids, they become very possible and kids maybe are led to some deeper understanding of the material. I have seen real advantages in using these methods in my classroom and I think I would like to know a little bit about what you have experienced in your classroom. Something that um, I have experienced is that children are working much more hands-on in the inquiry-based classroom, for example. All the activities and the tasks are you know, just student-centered and they are in charge of the learning and it's not me, the teacher, who's just telling them. They are hands-on doing what they're learning. In my social studies classes, I tend to take a half lecture, half discussion based um, type of model. And so, like for example, one time I was teaching my middle school kids, they're about 13 years old, about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And one of the kids had a question, kind of halfway through, midway through, about 
Obamacare. He, I mean, he called it Obamacare, it's the Affordable Care Act. And he was wondering how health insurance works and why there's these constitutional questions that some people might have. So I completely deviated the lesson and went on this tangent and telling them how insurance pools worked, how the Affordable Care Act works, and what the constitutional questions or what the objections might be to mandated health insurance. And so you had these kids who are actually interested in health insurance, whereas this wasn't in my lesson plan at all. I was supposed to teach them, you know, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, but they were completely engaged in this and it was a very productive discussion to where everybody was participating at the same time. And contrast that with if you had said, well, today we're going to talk about the Affordable Care Act, they may not have had that same level of interest as when that question naturally came up in the context of another lesson. Exactly. Their eyes would have glazed over if that was the actual agenda. Yeah. You used the spark that they had. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think... Played off of it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, an advantage that I noticed has to do with uh, me as a writing teacher. When I used to have 120 to 160 students, I was teaching writing to. I know, painful. I could give these little comments, but that was all I had time for. To just read all of their writing took an incredible amount of time. Now, when I'm teaching in much smaller groups, I'm able to write long paragraphs, detailed notes on their work, so they're getting a great deal of feedback from me. Plus, in class, they are engaged and on task because they're working on my individual feedback and they're getting my personal attention going around explaining that feedback, working with them on it, and helping them develop their ideas further. So concluding from these advantages that we just talked about, I think that we spend much more time with each child in our classes because of the class size. And because we are able to do that, we have a much better understanding of who the child is, how do they like to learn, what kind of learner are they, and by knowing all of these facts about the child, we can amend our lesson planning. We can differentiate our classes on a daily basis to cater exactly to the needs of the kids that we have in class. Of course, differentiation is one of those fancy education terms, which really means that we're able to individualize what we're teaching for the different students in the class at their level, based upon their interests, based upon their educational needs. And something that I've noticed, something that you just mentioned, Mark, is that because we can give them the oral and written feedback in much more detail, testing becomes much more less of a focus because we are assessing the children there and then in the class because we can with just 10 to 15 students. And I think the big overall question right now is can we actually afford to basically double the amount of teachers because if we're going from a classroom of 30 kids down to about 15 kids we're going to need basically the same amount of teachers added to the pool plus the infrastructure at schools as far as building new classrooms or whatever might be needed to make this actually work so according to the national center for education statistics our country spends about 300 billion dollars on teacher salaries and benefits as of right now um, so we're basically going to have to find another $300 billion to make this all work. Yeah, I don't think that you're going to get $300 billion out of my wallet. I don't think so. You'd have to overturn a lot of couches to find this kind of uh, pocket change. Um, currently, right now, education is mostly uh, funded by state and local governments. And this is through corporate and local sales tax and property taxes. Um, the federal government does spend a little bit, but we'll... Um, get into that in a second. There is also something called the lotteries, so state lotteries. 44 states have lotteries and not all of them actually devote all of their uh, sales to education. I thought that's how we got to accept the lotteries. The lotteries were supposed to put all their money into education, therefore we would accept this type of government gambling. <laughs> that's how they sell it to you, but only a little over half of the states that actually have lotteries give it solely to education. Um, but if you look at 2013, lottery sales totaled about $68 billion. Mm -hmm. So you subtract about half a billion dollars in payouts, maybe another billion dollars spread out amongst the states as far as advertising and infrastructure for the lottery. 
you're looking at about $45 billion. After you take out the half a billion per state and then the other costs. Right, and then the other costs that might be uh, extraneous to it. So we're at about $255 billion if all of those states actually devoted it solely to education. So we're getting there, but we need a little Almost more money. There. Yeah, just a, a couple more couches. Um, so this is where the federal government could potentially step in. So if we bring up the pie chart of federal spending in 2015, we can see the overall budget was uh, $3.8 trillion. Um, education only makes up 3% of that. So that's 100, roughly $100 billion. The question is what our priorities are at right now. Um, you have military at $600 billion. You have interest on debt, 220. Could we reallocate some of these resources to better fund education and to bring the U.S. into the top tier of education in general? Because right now we're, we're not. We're not, not in the right industrialized, now. out of industrialized countries, we're not near the top at all. No. So it's just all a question of priorities. Can we fix tax reform to make the pie grow larger, maybe fund all of these pie slices a little bit more. Well, with tax reform, you're not talking about taking it out of my pocket again, are you? No. This is just getting rid of tax loopholes, basically. I see. And making sure everybody's paying their fair share. Or can we rethink some of this pie chart a little bit to fund education and give students the sound, basic education that they deserve? So part of it might come from taxing those who are getting uh, unfair tax breaks. Part of it might be from reducing the over $600 billion we put in towards the military. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it might have to do with uh, agricultural reform or interest on debt. And if we keep pulling 10, 20, $30 billion out of each of these areas in the federal budget, all of a sudden we're able to pay for this and maybe cut class size in half. And have nationwide class reduction. You know, I think overall, we have to go back to our initial question. What should a society provide to its children when it comes to education? It may be very hard to definitively say what makes for a sound basic education. It may be very hard to definitively say what's going to best meet the needs of our kids. It's, it's even very difficult to study. But I think we need to listen to our teachers and the experience of tens of thousands of teachers around the country, so many of whom are saying, we have these types of practices that allow for deep learning and we can't use them. How sad is it that we know ways to reach kids, to help them have the deepest level of understanding and we're saying, we just don't have the resources. I think the bottom line is that we may not have the will, but we may have the resources, and it may just take a little bit of reallocation. That's all the time we have in this episode of EduTalk. Please join us next time.